Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our patient management series. In this video, we're going to talk about the prevention of oral diseases. And since caries is the disease we're most concerned with, we're going to talk mostly in this video about how to prevent dental caries. So there are several different categories of prevention that we do need to know for the board exam. So primary prevention prevents disease before it occurs. And a good example of this would be sealants and water fluoridation. Secondary prevention eliminates or reduces disease after it occurs. So a good example of this would be amalgam or composite restorations. And tertiary prevention rehabilitates a patient after the disease process has taken place. So a good example of this would be like dentures, after teeth had to be removed because of the extent of disease, and now we're replacing what used to be there. So fluoride has both a topical and systemic effect. Topical fluorides strengthen teeth already present in the mouth, making them more resistant to decay, while systemic fluoride is ingested and is incorporated into the teeth that are actively forming. But systemic fluoride also provides a topical effect because this fluoride enters the saliva, which then constantly bathes the teeth. So fluoride is so critically important to preventing dental caries. Now this slide is filled to the brim with high yield facts for the board exam. Community water fluoridation is a very effective public health intervention and it was initiated in the United States since 1945 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's the most cost-effective and most practical preventive measure to prevent tooth decay. And think about it, there's a minimal cost to society and no cost to the individual. Once fluoride is placed into the drinking water, everyone in that community benefits, and it takes little to no effort to just drink the city water. So this is really a blessing in communities that have it. The prevalence of caries in the U.S. significantly declined from the early 1970s to the mid-1990s, due in part to community water fluoridation and other public health measures. One part per million, or ppm, which is one milligram of fluoride per liter of water, is the optimal amount. And fluoride is odorless, colorless, and tasteless when in the proper range of 0.7 to 1.2 ppm. So in other words, it's completely imperceptible when in the proper range. And about 210 million people, which is at the time of measuring about 74% of the US population, live in presently fluoridated communities. So school water fluoridation is at f about 4.5 times the concentration of community water since students are only at school for part of the day. Fluoride mouth rinses are another excellent program to institute at school, but not quite as cost and time efficient as water fluoridation. And salt fluoridation is for developing countries that don't have a safe public water supply. And for salt fluoridation, you would use about 200 to 350 milligrams of fluoride per kilogram of salt. And a combination of both water and salt fluoridation is not recommended. So either one or the other will suffice. All right, fluoride supplements. These are by prescription only. And this is important. These supplements are only for children at risk for caries who live in non-fluoridated areas. This means no community or school water fluoridation, and they're drinking well water or bottled water without fluoride. Now, depending on the age of the child, different fluoride supplements may be recommended. If they're less than or equal to three years old, fluoride drops are the best supplement. Because children this young, have difficulty chewing and swallowing tablets. If they're older than three years old, fluoride tablets and lozenges 
are a better method. And if they're if they're more than six years old, then fluoride mouth rinse is the best, either um, a higher concentration weekly or a lower concentration daily. And this is because now at this age, the child has developed the oral musculature coordination to swish rinse around in their mouth. So we have here a fluoride supplement dosage schedule. Now this chart has a lot of information and I've only rarely seen information asked on the board exam directly from this table, but I have seen questions come from it so I had to include it. But a nice easy high yield way to remember some of this information is the rule of sixes, which states that no supplemental systemic fluoride is indicated if the fluoride in the drinking water is greater than 0.6 parts per million, and that represents this column on the right. If no supplemental systemic fluoride is indicated if the patient is less than six months old, which is the top column, or if the patient is greater than 16 years old, which would be underneath the, the chart here. It would be an imaginary column if the ages continued past 16 years. So 0.6, 6, and 16, hence why it's called the rule of sixes, is showing that section of the population that doesn't need supplemental systemic fluoride. So nice high yield way, easy to memorize that information. All right, next let's talk about topical fluoride. So these agents have been clinically proven to reduce dental caries, and they're best for smooth surfaces. So think like facial surfaces of all the teeth, lingual surfaces, and not this is not talking about the occlusal surfaces. So topical fluoride can also help with root caries and ECC, which we talked about in the last video, early childhood caries. Varnish is adhesive, and maximizes fluoride tooth contact with about 5% fluoride. That's what we see in the bottom left. And then acidulated phosphate fluoride, or APF gel, which is in the bottom right, has a pH of about three and is 1.23% fluoride. So APF gel temporarily and gently demineralizes enamel in a controlled way. So it, it does demineralize the enamel, but that is so that it can remineralize it with these fluoride ions directly applied to the teeth that are located within the gel. So either or, varnish is, is clinically proven as the best method, but APF gel is also very nice. Stannous fluoride has the benefit of being a fluoride delivery agent, but it also has an antimicrobial effect and that's because it has this chemical reaction where you have a dissociated tin ion that helps battle the bacteria. But the problem is it has a really bad taste and it also can cause yellow-brown tooth staining, similar to what you might see with a chlorhexidine rinse. Okay, now we have to talk about fluoride toxicity. And a good way to remember these numbers is by the rule of fives. So we had the rule of sixes with fluoride, now we have the rule of fives. So the numbers to remember here is that a toxic dose is around five milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And the lethal dose is about five to 10 grams of fluoride for an average 70 kilogram adult. So this is a lot of fluoride. That's a ton of fluoride to be at these kind of levels. Now, acute toxicity symptoms may include nausea, vomiting, loss of consciousness, cramping, damage to the stomach lining, among other things. And chronic toxicity involves fluorosis of teeth, which you may have heard of, and fluorosis is the abnormal enamel mineralization that results from excessive fluoride exposure during enamel formation. Now, fluoride is believed to be least effective on occlusal surfaces. Remember, fluoride was really good on those smooth surfaces, but not so much on in the cracks and crevices of the teeth. 
And that's where sealants come into play. They're really good for the occlusal surfaces. And they're recommended for first and second permanent molars for children at risk for caries. So it's able to smooth over the, the fossa and the grooves of these teeth that are most susceptible to getting cavities. And sometimes they're so, these crevices are so tiny that toothbrush bristles can't effectively clean them. And so bacteria can have a party in these grooves. And so sealants are, are shown to help prevent caries in these regions, but it has to be paired with excellent oral hygiene. Mouth guards, now we're not talking about caries here, but they are a great preventative tool. And mouth guards are not the most comfortable, but wow, they're helpful to prevent possible injury to the teeth. They're made for athletes to prevent tooth trauma. And protruding upper incisors are especially vulnerable to trauma. So those kids with class two kids with really protrusive incisors are at a higher risk for tooth trauma, especially if they're very active. So any sport you can think of, basketball, football, you name it, everyone should be absolutely wearing a mouth guard to protect their teeth. All right, so health education, we'll talk about this just briefly here. Health literacy is the capacity at which individuals obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services. So there's this discrepancy between the terms that dentists may use day to day and the terms that the public is exposed to day to day. And it's up to the dentist to bridge the gap between those two worlds. And that's where health literacy comes into play. But education alone cannot function as a method to prevent disease. In fact, studies show that behavioral modification is much more effective than patient education to increase compliance with dental care. So focus on motivational interviewing and all the things we talked about in the health behavior change video for more effective disease prevention. But if we work to talk about dental education, which is absolutely critical, and oral health and oral hygiene instruction should be occurring at every dental exam paired with behavior change, So dental education, if we're talking about toothbrushing, the patient should know that dental plaque is the main cause of both caries and periodontal disease, and children under six years should be supervised when brushing with fluoride toothpaste. Flossing does not prevent tooth decay, but may be helpful for gingival health. Now, I might disagree with this just a little bit. I think it does help for interproximal caries, but there are no studies to show that because Nobody really wants to fund a giant flossing study, but anecdotally, I do think it helps prevent tooth decay, but for the board exam, definitely know that flossing is is helpful for gingival health. And lastly, diet is another thing we should be talking to about patients. The frequency of sugar consumption is more important than the amount of sugar consumption. And this goes back to uh, the pH in the mouth, and every time we eat, our pH drops. So this has to do with, um, there's a curve that I talk about in, uh, I have a Science of Cavities video series. This is the Stefan curve. And so that's where frequency of sugar consumption comes into more significance than the amount. And so other important factors with diet, are they eating these sugary foods during the day or is it immediately before they go to bed? And the length of time that sticky residual food material remains in the mouth is also important. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Ian Zalau, David Jaden, Yannet, and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to these video slides if you want to take notes on them and practice questions for the board exam. So go check those out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.